Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. I already have a bird feeder and want to get more birds? Try adding a bird bath. Also, around here, fungus and blight are a constant tomato problem. We'll talk about when and what to spray. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Debbie Bruce. Miss Debbie is the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited, and Mr. D is here. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank right you there. for having me. Ms. Deb, we always like to have you here because okay. we always like to talk about the birds. Oh, right? I enjoy it too. I know you do. So today we're going to talk about bird baths, mm -hmm. okay? So sure. how important is water to birds? Well, how important is water to you? Very important. <laughs> Our bodies are made up of mostly water, That's right? That's right. Okay. And we need water every day and so does nature. Okay. So do the birds. It's an essential part of habitat that many times people forget. Aha. Uh -huh. And yes, when it's raining, nature <laughs> provides the water. Right. But there's times when it's not available. Okay. Plus, if you have a bird bath in your yard, the birds that come to your feeders will, will more than likely attend a bird bath. We'll utilize that too, so you can enjoy their interaction there. Okay. Plus, you have birds in the canopies of the trees that are never going to come down to your feeders because they're not feeder birds. Ah. But Water's a common denominator. Everybody needs water, so they'll come. So they'll come. Have water, they they'll will come. come. <laughs> you like that, Mr. D? I do. <laughs> uh, all right, so how are we going to incorporate all of this into our backyards, though, to attract those birds? There's a lot of different options that you can do. Okay. You can do as simple as a little plant saucer, very little saucer filled with water. Mm -hmm. You can do a ground bath. You can do a pedestal bath. You can do a hanging bath. What's important though is that you have the correct depth. You don't want it too deep so you, the little guys will be uh, apprehensive to get into the water because they're gonna come and drink and they're gonna come and bathe and get in there and shake around and get the water, <laughs> water through those feathers and get clean because uh, clean feathers means that you can fly well. You're oh, a healthy bird. Okay. Okay, so you want two inches or less okay. in your water, in your depth. And some folks already have an existing bird bath that's really too deep, and you can shallow it by adding rocks, uh, putting a stone in the middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And yeah. that will help out our little birdies. Okay. It sure will. All right. So how do we take care of the bird bath? Very important. Uh, you want to change your water out about every two to three days, especially, mm. especially in the hot months when we have mosquitoes around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mosquitoes. Of course, you know, they like to breed in water, but if you empty your bath every two to three days and freshen it up with fresh water, then you don't have that problem. Right. Or if you add moving water to your bath, mosquito larva can't go through the process it needs to do when the water is moving. Okay. So moving water, not only that, moving water will attract the birds readily hmm. to the bath. I brought a few okay. items here to show you how to keep your bath clean, okay? <laughs> If you can dump your bath, scrub it out really well because it's going to have algae on it and also the bird droppings. They can't mm. help it. That's what happens. Right. And you scrub it out, you rinse it out, and then you start with fresh water. Now, about once a month at least, we advise a deep cleaning, which would be nine parts of water to one part of bleach okay. or vinegar. Or and vinegar. That, or vinegar. Okay. And that's going to kill that algae okay. that's in there and then rinse it really well and start fresh. Now, some folks have baths that are so large, it's very difficult to dump. Right. And hose that out and start with a fresh, clean bath. And we have enzymes. These are natural enzymes that eat the gunk in the bath. Okay. They need to be added with every time you put fresh water in. Okay. Now, how and much they, would you add, I guess? The, uh, it says the on the back. Okay. Uh, just a capful for one okay. to five gallons, so this will last you a good long time, wow. and it's safe for wildlife. Okay. We wouldn't have anything in there that would harm them. This is a bird bath protector. This is a, f a fountain protector. It's the same enzymes, but this one has a defomer in it, so your bird 
fountain doesn't look like it's covered with bubbles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually have one of those large, you know, bird baths. So yeah, I have to kind of get out the hose and clean mm -hmm. it up a little bit. So that's good. I have to look into that. Okay. Now let's talk again about this moving water, right? So mm -hmm. we actually have. We brought example. some examples today of moving water. The black hook hanging on the side of the bath is a dripper and it can be regulated down to just drip, drip, drip. <laughs> also in the bath is a bubbling rock. Ah. And that rock is going to recirculate the existing water. So your, your dripper is going to be hooked up to your outside garden faucet. It okay. runs off of water pressure. Birds hear and see moving water. So this is going to be a magnet to them. The bubbling rock runs on electricity. Mm -hmm. So you have to have mm -hmm. outdoor electricity for that. You wouldn't want both units in the same bath, so it's an either or choice on that one. Okay. There's other things you can do though that I didn't even bring, okay. and that's things such as a wiggler. It looks like a big green mushroom that sits <laughs> in the bath and it runs on two batteries and it just spins the water. And the spinning makes ripples and the ripples attract the birds, but the ripples also prevent mosquitoes from okay. breeding as mm -hmm. this would prevent mosquitoes from breeding. Or you can be just as simplistic as saving a gallon milk jug. How about that? And filling it with water, hanging it on a branch of a tree above your, your bird bath and sticking it one time with an ice pick. And it'll drip, drip, How about drip. That? It has the same effect. That's oh, something fun to do with children. Okay. Yeah, especially. Now in the winter time, water is oh. extremely important. We drink water sure, all year long, sure. so do birds. They have to bathe all year long, just as we do. But in the winter time, when your water is frozen, or if it's the weatherman says we're going to get freezing water, put in an electric de-icer. Okay. It's a unit that does run off of electricity, but it prevents your water from freezing over. And when you have the only open spot of water in the area, birds are just going to flock to it. There'd it's fun. <laughs> It is fun. Let me ask you this. Can the water get too hot for the birds, though? No, good question. Okay. Sometimes folks will think, oh, it's like a hot tub. <laughs> it, it's thermostatically controlled. Your de-icer is. Okay. It kicks on, I believe, when your water temperature or your outside temperature goes below 40. Okay. But it will not allow the water to heat up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it'll be fine. It's okay. regulated. How about that? So yeah. no spa for the birds, huh? Right. <laughs> now... Let's talk a little bit about, again, those mosquitoes. So you can actually purchase those mosquito dunks. Yes. Right? I mean, those would be good to use That's in there as correct. well. correct. It contains BT, mm -hmm. uh, and it's safe for the birds and, you know, right. the other pests and things like that, uh -huh. pets. Even says on the package that it's safe. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good stuff. Yes. You have a bird bath, Mr. D? I do not. But uh, I might get one. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> you thinking about it? Mm -hmm. I think he likes the bubbler. <laughs> <I think that's laughs> we, we have the feeders. We have a, a lot of bird feeders sure. and hummingbird feeders, and uh, mm -hmm. but we don't have a way. Of, we don't have any water for them. That's why they don't hang around very long. Uh -huh. Well, you will get even more birds when you incorporate water with your feeder than just a feeder alone. And you mentioned hummingbirds. Um, yes. There's a little white tip, a nozzle that can go on the end of that dripper. Hummingbirds really like a mist, okay. mm -hmm. and they will. You can adapt that to be a mist, and they'll fly through the mist. Or there oh, are misters that you can twine up into a tree, such as a, a small dogwood tree or that, and it connects to your garden hose, and it just puts out a soft cloud of water nice. vapor. And it's a lot of fun too, because not only hummingbirds, but on a dry day, you turn on your mister, and the leaves of the tree will collect the moisture, mm -hmm. and you'll have little birds going in that leaf bathe. So oh, it's damn. better entertainment than TV. Been except taken. for this show. Okay, except for the <laughs> show, right. Except for the family flight. Miss Deb, we appreciate that. Always good information. Always good to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you much. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. Hi, Mr. D. 
This is the Mid-South. We love our tomatoes, but tomatoes we know have many problems. They do, they do. We need a spray schedule for our tomatoes. Can you help us out? I can, I okay. can. I mean, the UT and the Red Book mm -hmm. can also help you out. Mm -hmm. uh, the most common problem on, on tomatoes uh, in our high humidity environment is, is uh, a blight. Yes. And uh, late blight is uh, the number one disease mm -hmm. problem on tomatoes in our area. And it occurs early in the yeah, season. Yeah, it comes early. Yeah, I don't know why they call yeah. it late blight. But uh, the, 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 the best way to take care of that is to put your tomatoes on a spray schedule. Uh, uh, you need to remember, for the most part, fungicides, especially vegetable fungicides that are approved on vegetables, are preventative in nature only. Mm -hmm. So if you wait until you see the disease, then you, you're, you're, you're behind in the game because the fungicides that we put out there on vegetables are, will not treat a problem. They simply will prevent it from spreading. Right. So if, if, I, if you want to pre prevent tomato disease problems, start spraying early. Spray if during dry conditions every 14 days with either chlorothalonil or mancozeb. If it's r during rainy conditions, <laughs> if you haven't gotten more than a two inch rain, then just still you can spray about every seven days. Okay. If it rains more than two inches, oh. you assume it washed the fungicide off. Now that, if you apply the fungicide uh, today and it rains tomorrow, a half inch rain, just stick on the seven day schedule, provided, provided that the fungicide had time to dry on the plant. Okay. Now if you get out there and spray right now and 15 minutes later <laughs> you, get, rains, you right. get a half inch rain, right. then your fungicide's washed off. Right. So, so it needs to dry on the leaves. Uh, before it's rain fast. Uh, during dry conditions, if we don't get a lot of rain, you could spread that length of time out to 14 days uh, every two weeks. And I recommend uh, uh, mixing the chemistry, you know, mentioned Mancozeb mm -hmm. and Chlorothalonil. Uh, get both of those products and then I would spray one of them one week and uh -huh. the other one the next week and just alternate them. Right. Um, that way you will uh, hopefully prevent uh, uh, resistance building up with that fungus. Uh, yeah. But uh, do that. Uh, if you start to see some insects causing you a problem there, uh, tomato hornworms or something like mm -hmm. that, simply include some BT in that same spray mixture, you know, and, and you can so mix, you can you, do you that. Can mix the sure. fungicide okay. with the insecticides. Right. And, and, uh, and, and the, or if you don't have any insect problems, just strictly go with the fungicide. Okay. But if you do that, and you do that up until frost, you <laughs> should have good homegrown tomatoes until that time. So you would start with the application with the fungicides when? Now. Now. now because the disease pressure is already out there. Right. I would start now. Uh, I wouldn't wait until I see the disease, you know, because then you're behind. Stay ahead of the game with, with fungicides. And you got to make sure you have to get good coverage, though. I mean, you talk got about to have that. good yeah. coverage. Uh, you need to spray to the point of runoff. You don't have to drench the plant and let, yeah. let it run off the plant, but spray to just before that happens. And that's like tightening the bolt to like one quarter of an inch before it breaks. You know, it's really kind of hard to figure out exactly how to do that. But spray just to the point of runoff. Make sure you direct your spray to the underside of the leaves right. and to right. lower the plant. You've got to get really good coverage. So with these small tomato plants, that's real easy to do mm -hmm. when, it, when, it, when they're real small. Uh, as they get larger, then you've got to, it'll take more product yeah. and, and it'll take a little bit more time uh, to, to make sure that you, you know, get good coverage. But, you know, make sure you have, have good coverage with it. It's, a, it's just like a, applying a, it's a prophylactic treatment. It's a, like a raincoat. Yeah. And, and is any area of that leaf that's not protected uh, is susceptible of a, most of these fungicide or fun, fungus diseases are are caused by wind mm -hmm. deposited spores, and if a spore lands on a fungicide treated leaf, it's going to die. But if it lands on a leaf that doesn't have any fungicide on it, you know, it, it will start spreading. Good analogy. Yeah, and 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 if you get to the, like I said earlier, if you get to the point where you've got some disease anyway, if you're in a real rainy week or two and you've got some disease, just continue spraying, and you will stop it from spreading to the new growth. You won't, the, the, the leaves that are damaged will continue to be damaged, but they'll 
we won't spread to your new right. growth. And right. so, so don't get discouraged if you have a little disease pressure anyway. Uh, but uh, be faithful, seven to 14 days. Uh, Mancozeb, Chlorothalidil, a combination of those. And uh, follow label directions. Yeah, follow Always label. follow label directions. Uh, wash your tomatoes real good yes. when you, you know, before you eat them. Yes. Yeah. When is the best time to spray the fungicide? Because I'm sure somebody's thinking about that. I would say uh, you, w- you want to make sure the fungicide dries on the plant. So probably the worst time to spray would be late in the afternoon yeah. right before sundown, yeah. right at dark right. or at night because that plant will stay wet longer mm-hmm. and fungal diseases like wet conditions. Right. So early in the day, middle of the day, you know, mid-afternoon, as long as, as that plant can dry after you apply the product, then you're in good shape. You want to make sure it dries. We'll make sure the plant can dry. A couple other points. Uh, talk about the importance of using mulch. Mm-hmm. Right. That's good. Uh, mulch is, is really good because uh, uh, some of the uh, fungal organisms are, are if rainfall, they'll, they'll splash up from the ground. And if you have a good, uh, good mulch, good straw mulch, uh, or newspaper, newspaper, or pine right. straw, or wheat straw, mm-hmm. or leaf, any kind of mulch uh, will, will uh, not only help prevent disease to the lower part of that plant, but it'll also, you know, help conserve water and uh, help control weeds. That's right. Which is really important. Weed barrier. Mr. D, that's good stuff. Also, mm-hmm. staking the plant, right. getting it up. Getting it off the uh, ground. Right. Well, is, is, you know, any way you can get air movement. Right. So that will help the plant dry is also right. good too. Right. And we talked about that earlier, Miss Debbie. Yes, air is. circulation is very important to get those leaves to dry off. That's right. Mr. D, we appreciate that. Good, good deal. Stuff. All right. This is a lovely specimen of coral bark Japanese maple grown for this brilliant red twigs, which makes a distinctive plant for winter interest. And it's a great plant for the south and very sun tolerant. Um, it was planted a little bit of high, which is good for a Japanese maple, but this heavy staking can be an issue. And let's talk about the fact that often when you have a plant with a large canopy, you're going to need to stake it for blowing over. There's a few options though. Um, a staked plant, especially when staked this tightly, is not going to be able to move in the wind, and it should be able to move in the wind in order to build up strength. It's a, a thing called taper, and every time it blows, there's a little bit of cambium tear, and it'll get stronger and stronger. Since this is not able to move in the wind, it actually makes it weak, so when we remove these, it's more likely to flop. So if you absolutely have to stake, you should certainly make this a little bit looser so that they could still do some blowing around in the wind, stake it just tightly enough to keep it from blowing over. And the padding here on the bark is a good idea. An option would have been to take these stakes and rather than tying the tree to it, if you had simply hammered them through the root ball at a, three different points at angle so that you're actually nailing the root ball into the firm ground below, then the tree is able to move in the wind and build up that strength and taper over time. If you do have to do this, maybe a year, uh, possibly more before you can remove the stakes and hopefully by then the roots are well integrated into the ground and the maple's ready to be on its own. All right, this is our Q&A session. Ms. David, you jump in there and help us out if you have something to say, okay? All right, here's our first viewer email. I've noticed yellow spots in my lawn recently. My first thought was that my lawn service had spot sprayed weeds, but it's definitely something else. What is it and how do I take care of it? And this is from Miss Anise right here in Memphis. Well, Miss Anise, guess what that is? It is the red thread fungus. Pretty much a cosmetic fungus. And it actually will grow out of this condition. But you have to think about our conditions this spring. It was wet, it was cool. Wet, cool conditions, you're going to have fungal diseases. This just happens to be red thread fungus. And you can actually see from the little tent, the little red tent uh, from that picture, and that's what it is. I've seen it in neighborhoods throughout Shelby County uh, this spring, again, because of the conditions. Don't worry about it. You don't have to treat it with a fungicide. It will grow out of it as it starts to warm up. No need to treat it. Now, I usually see it in lawns that are deficient in nitrogen, so soil tests, okay? Let's see what our nitrogen levels are. Uh, you might have to add some uh, nitrogen, but other than that, 
I wouldn't worry about it. It will warm up and the grass will be just fine. All right, so thanks for that question. All right, here's our next video email. Is it true that angel trumpet leaves are poisonous? And this is from Craig in Middleton. I can answer that one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the leaves are poisonous, the seeds are poisonous, and the flowers. Yeah, yeah if you consume a lot of them, yeah. yeah. Make you sick. Yeah, it's gonna make you sick. You know. So don't just go grazing on stuff. You need to eat what you grow in the garden. We know <laughs> right. we know turnip greens are okay <laughs> right. and mustard greens and you know that's good and right. even poke salad. <laughs> yeah, poke, poke salad, right? You know, yeah. berries are poisonous right. and poke salad. So. Right. Yeah, but it, yeah, yeah, but yeah, definitely the leaves are poisonous and again the uh, so are the seeds, so are the flower. Beautiful plant. Mm -hmm. uh, Brugmansia, that's what it is. That's the, the genus. Mm -hmm. Brugmansia, that's what that is. Uh, but yeah, just don't consume too much of it because it's definitely poison. It's, you know, it causes fevers, hallucinations, paralysis, all those kind of things. So you have to be careful about that. Now you're <laughs> going to have people trying it. Yeah, <laughs> be careful with all that stuff. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, a lot of things that are really pretty yeah. uh, and eye catching, eye appealing, are, are poisonous, even in the animal kingdom. Some of the really prettiest fishes ah. that are out there are, you know, are, are you know, toxic. Right. And, and so that is something to think about. Maybe a defense yeah. mechanism. Because it's a beautiful plant. Right. You know, You're exactly right. They don't have to worry about things eating them up because right. you know, they'll make them sick. All right. Yeah. So, Mr. Craig, yeah, they definitely uh, make you sick. It's poisonous. And believe it or not, it's in the same family as tomatoes. Yeah. So the Nightshade family. Yeah. Right. Nightshade family. Yeah. yeah. So how about that? There you go. All right, here's our next video email. How can you get rid of purslane? It is all over my garden. And this is from Rose in Stanton, Tennessee. You know about purslane, don't you, Mr. D? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sucking at leaves, right? Mm -hmm. Produces by seeds, root mm -hmm. fragments. Do you know about purslane, Mr. Debbie? I just pulled up a bunch of it. Here we go. <laughs> and you, may, you better make sure you get all of it because the seeds can actually survive in the ground for 40 years. Oh, my goodness. Be yep. careful. Survival, folks. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that is. So how do we control that? And speaking of control, I know one means of control. They're edible. The leaves are actually edible. So they're not toxic. Really? Yeah. So eat them. Huh? You can eat them. Are they good? Yeah, they taste pretty good. They're succulent. Especially if you have a big chunk of bacon in there. <laughs> <laughs> if you have something like that, it tastes better, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we know that they're edible, but how else can we uh, control them? In a vegetable garden, you know, you got your hoe. You know, yeah. good old cultivation. Uh -huh. Well, you know, run your uh, your, your uh, cultivator if you've got one. Uh, but uh, I know there aren't many pre-emergent herbicides or post-emergent herbicides that you could spray in the garden. Mm -hmm. That uh, in would, the garden, would, that, that all your vegetables wouldn't be affected. You know, Treflan has some activity on it, and it's cleared for use for some garden vegetables, but not all of them. Right, but. Uh, I'd probably stick with mechanical and you know, using the hoe and cultivator mm -hmm. to the, in my garden. In your yard. Yeah, it's a different story. It's a totally right. different story. Different story. Because you can use pre several pre emergent mm -hmm. products and post emergent products sure to can. take it out. Yeah. Did I appear, you know, pendomethalin in your lawn mm -hmm. you yeah, know, for pre and post? Anything that cont uh, contains what, 2,4 D, dicamba? Right. You know, that kind of stuff. Of course, that'll also wipe your garden out. Yeah, yeah. that will wipe your garden out. Yeah. yeah, you can do that in the lawn setting, but not in your garden. So. Yeah. Garden hoe, Miss Rose, garden hoe. That will help you out. Mm -hmm. All right, here's our next via email. I had a soil test done on my garden, but the results didn't come back until everything started to come up. Can I follow the recommendations of a late soil test now or wait until after the growing season? And this is from Mike. And it's actually a good question. It is. It mm -hmm. is. And it's the answer question. is yes. Yeah. Go on and yeah. follow it. You know, go and put the fertilizer out. You may not be able to. You, as you broadcast it, you don't want to get it on the leaves of the plants if you can help it. But uh, go ahead and put the fertilizer out now. It's still early. It's still uh -huh. plenty early. Right. And uh, uh, I mean, and that soil test will you can follow that for three years. Yeah, three and, years. Right. You know, the only time that you probably don't want to apply fertilizer is late in the year, just before frost, to a perennial. Yeah. You know, because you don't want a flush of new growth to occur right before a freeze. Right. You know? uh, but so, yeah, anytime, and, and a lot of the uh, soil test recommendations will talk about side dressing mm -hmm. anyway, but but if you, if you have a complete fertilizer that's recommended, you know, N, P, and K, I'd go on and put that out now, and you'll be okay. And then go 
follow it up with a with a side dress if that's recommended. Right, and it'd be good to know what he tested his soil for. You know, if he was trying to grow a garden or lawn or anything like that. But he did say, "Oh my garden." Oh my garden. Yeah, Yeah, it sounds like I'm assuming it might be a vegetable garden garden or something like that. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Right. Ornamentals. Yeah. Yeah, I'd go on and start. But I would. I would go ahead and follow it because it's good for three years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I will do that. So there you have it, Mike. So Ms. Debbie, Mr. D, we're out of time. That was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. Want to see how to apply that fungicide Mike was talking about or fertilize your garden? Head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have hundreds of gardening videos to show you what to do and how to do it. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.